All right. We will be taking up our Lottie Moon Christmas offering next week, next Sunday morning. Um, and like the video uh, says, there all of those were missionaries, international missions uh, missionaries who had gone on uh, on missionary journeys somewhere in a, in a foreign country somewhere. And um, you see the way that the Lottie Moon Christmas offering had impacted them, and the way that they were able to do what they needed to do because of. Uh, local churches like ourselves that uh, support that Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So we will take that offering up um, next next Sunday morning. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to come to you now and I want to ask you, uh, Lord, that you would begin, that you would take over right now. Lord, that you would reign in this place. Lord, that you, your spirit would fill this place right now. And Lord, that it would, uh, that you would use me to spread your word. Lord, use me to speak your word this morning. Lord, I just want to be an instrument of of your uh, message. And so I want to step out of the way, and I want to remove myself, Lord, and I pray that you would speak through me and allow this message that it would change our hearts, that it would, our minds, that it would change who we are in you. And that uh, in that, Lord, we would become the follower of you that you so desire us to be. And so, Lord, use me now to speak, to speak your word, and it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Um, our text this morning is going to come from the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter 1, and I've said this multiple times, and I will probably say it every time that I preach from, from the book of Romans, I love the book of Romans, love the book of Romans. Um, I love the, the doctrine that's in it, I love the... Uh, the, the, the security and the truth, uh, and I love the message that the Apostle Paul preaches in, in, the, in the book of Romans. Uh, Chuck Swindoll says, speaking about studying the book of Romans, he says, whatever your situation, wherever you happen to be in your spiritual journey, I am convinced that the time you invest in a careful study of this letter, talking about Romans, that caref- the, the careful study, uh, Excuse me, the time you invest in the careful study of this letter will change you forever. Um, and so that's one reason I really love the book of Romans. We're going to be reading from uh, chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read uh, through verse 7. So if you would, please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. In the beginning of this letter uh, that Paul is writing to the believers uh, in Rome, the Apostle Paul basically uses a, a very long greeting. Uh, verses 1 through 4 uh, is, is, is one long sentence, and that whole thing, uh, verse 1 through 7, is one long greeting. It's one long introduction that Paul gives to the believers there in Rome. And he uses a few different terms or a few different phrases, basically, to introduce himself or to describe himself. Now, this was necessary for Paul to do because of the fact that the majority of the believers in Rome didn't know who he was. They knew his reputation. They knew the work that he had done. They knew who he was before uh, his uh, Damascus Road conversion. They knew that he had gone and, and persecuted Christians and they had heard about his conversion and they had heard about his change, and they heard about the work that he was doing in Christ, uh, and they knew his work, but they didn't know him. They didn't, they'd never seen him face to face. If he were to walk into a room, uh, they wouldn't know him from Adam, which is kind of funny that you can use that talking about. They wouldn't know him from Adam. 
Um, and so it was necessary for, for Paul to introduce himself and to really kind of give a little bit of information about himself so that uh, they might would know him a little bit deeper than what his reputation had preceded him. And so the first term that Paul uses as he's introducing himself to the believers in Rome is he says that he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's calling himself a slave of Jesus. And this would have been uh, a term that would not really have gone over so well with, with the folks in Rome. Because, you see, the Romans were very proud people, almost like Americans of today. The Romans were very proud people, and uh, they, don't, they didn't like the idea of being called a slave. They were the type of people that would look down on you if you didn't match up with their standards. They were the type of people that would look at you and kind of you know, snuff their nose at you because you didn't match up with what they said or what they believed was the way you should dress or the way you should act or the way you should believe. Um, uh, they were the type of people that would look down on you if you didn't match up with their standards. And the idea of being a slave to the Romans, uh, with the exception of somebody serving in the government because they would do that willingly, that didn't really fit in with their culture. They didn't like the idea of being called a slave. In fact, the Romans despised the idea of servanthood uh, so much that it was almost the worst thing that somebody could say, that they were a servant or they were a slave. Uh, because the idea of being a servant or the idea of servanthood meant that you lost all of your freedom. You lost all of your respect. And, and when you lost that freedom, it meant that you also lost your dignity. You lost who you were. Uh, you lost your pride. You lost your power. You lost who you were and you became something else. So no one wanted to be a bond servant. No one wanted to address themselves as being a bond servant or a slave unless you're like Paul here and you're referring to being a servant of the Lord or being a servant of your God, whoever that may be. And in that, they, they found no greater title. So when Paul introduces himself as a slave, it kind of had a different meaning to it. Paul also adds in there that he, he was called to be an apostle of Jesus. Now an apostle is someone that is sent out to accomplish a task on behalf of the person that sent them. Uh, for example, in Genesis chapter 24, we find Abraham and he's sending out uh, one of his servants on a mission to locate a wife for his son Isaac. Uh, this position of, of apostleship or this position of being apostle also carries with it the idea that the person that is going out and, and uh, uh, trying to do the task or deliver the message or the person that went out uh, speaks with the same authority and the same uh, power as the person that sent them out. In Genesis, again, Abraham's servant, as he went out, he had the authority to make whatever necessary agreements or whatever necessary deals that it would have been needed on behalf of Abraham in order to locate that wife for his son. I liken it to like having a modern day power of attorney. Someone that possesses a, a power of attorney has the ability or has the authority or the same rights as the person who that a power of authority has been issued to. They can act on behalf of the person that they have that, that power of, author, of, of, of uh, attor, power of attorney for. Uh, many times in Jesus' day, kings would send out these uh, apostles to, to deal with or interact with other kings or other uh, leaders. Uh, we still do this today in, in several positions within our own federal government. You see uh, people who go and they, they act out on behalf of the president or they act out on behalf of uh, the government itself, probably the most notable of this being the, the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State travels around the world and, and interacts with different leaders within the world, and whatever the Secretary of State says, basically they speak with the same authority that the president does. And so that's the same thing as being an apostle. So for Paul to say that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ, he was implying, or uh, implying that he had the same authority and the same power as Jesus did. Matthew 10.1 says, And when Jesus had called his twelve disciples to him, 
He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. They went out from Him and they had the same power and the same authority that Christ had. And He gave them that authority. This office that Paul claims that he has uh, as being an apostle uh, is an office that a lot of people argued back then and, and even still argue today whether or not Paul could claim to be an apostle. In order to hold the, the position or have that title as apostle of Jesus Christ, they, they had set up, there was basically three qualifying factors that you had to meet in order to hold that office. The first one of those qualifying factors was that the individual had to have been a disciple of Jesus during his three-year ministry here on earth. Uh, the second was that the individual had to have been an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, he had to have seen Jesus at some point after he rose from the dead. And the third one, and the most important qualifying factor, was that the individual claiming to be an apostle of Jesus Christ had to have been called directly from Jesus. So being a disciple meant being or being a disciple and being an apostle was not the same thing. A lot of times we get those confused when we're talking about uh, those two different positions within within the 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 Bible, but they're two different things. A disciple is someone that is a learner or a student of a particular teacher. Jesus had many disciples. Uh, uh, on the day of Pentecost, it says there were 120 disciples that were there in the church or that were there that received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. They, there's, to be a disciple just means you learn from somebody. But to be an apostle is different. So Jesus had many disciples, but out of those many disciples, He picked 12 people to be His apostles. And He cho chose 12 people to speak on His behalf and to go out and to do His work. So Paul says that he was called to be an apostle. What caused or causes so many people or so much discussion is that Paul does not meet the first two requirements of being an apostle. He was not a disciple of Jesus Christ during Jesus' earthly ministry. In fact, we would, we would say that Paul was the complete opposite. Uh, Paul went out and killed the people that followed after Jesus. And second, Paul was not an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. He did not interact with Christ in his resurrected body before he ascended to heaven. But we said that the most important factor, the most important qualifying factor was that Paul had been directly called by Jesus to be an apostle. That is why the book of Acts, if you look in the book of Acts, it repeats uh, Paul's Damascus Road conversion three times. We see that in there three different times to make sure that the reader of the book of Acts understands that Jesus Christ Himself stopped Paul dead in his tracks and blinded him and called him to be an apostle. And when we see those words or we see phrases within the Bible that are repeated uh, multiple times, and especially if they're repeated three times, we can automatically assume that it carries some great importance with it. If somebody repeats something, it's because they wanted you to make sure that you got it. Uh, as a teacher, if we want somebody to understand something, we're going to repeat it. I will typically say, you might want to pay attention to what I'm saying. It will probably be on your test. And then I will say it multiple times. Um, so Paul says he's a bondservant of Jesus. He says he's an apostle of Jesus. And the third title that he uses, uh, or that he says, is that he is separated to the gospel of God. Now the word separated that he uses there is translated from the Greek word apharizo, and that word is only used ten times in the entire Bible, but it carries with it this very strong or very powerful message. It means to be set apart for a specific reason. To be severed from the rest of the people or from the rest of the flock or from a group of people. It means to be marked off with some sort of boundary as being different. Paul wasn't just 
separated uh, to being called to do something just like everybody else was doing. Paul wasn't separated to be to, to repeat the actions of everybody else. Paul was separated to do something completely different. He wasn't placing himself in the same boat as everybody else. He was placing himself in, in, in a boat all by himself. Paul wasn't just being separated or called to do something just like everyone else was. Uh, he said that he was called for a special, specific purpose. Purpose. God chose me over everyone else. He says, I've been separated to the gospel of God. What was his task? What was he separated to do? It was to preach the gospel of God. It was to preach the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. That, that, this was the gospel that Paul says that God promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul wasn't just preaching any new gospel. He wasn't making stuff up. Paul wasn't coming up with new ideas and new plans and, and new gospels and new ministries and all of this stuff. He says Paul that, that I am preaching a gospel that, that goes all the way back to the beginning. I'm not preaching anything different than anybody else is. Paul is preaching the gospel that he says is the same gospel that the prophets in the Old Testament preached. This is the gospel that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden to the, uh, uh, after the fall of man in the third chapter of Genesis where God says, and I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That was a prophecy, a prophecy that spoke of the, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for the salvation of mankind. God is saying that on the cross, Satan bruised the heel of Jesus, but through his death, Jesus Christ bruised the head of Satan or destroyed or his control over mankind. And that's why on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. The finished work that Jesus is talking about was the bruising of the head of Satan. The finished work that Jesus was talking about was the, the control and the power that Satan had over mankind. He said, it is finished. And it was, the, it was the ensuring of Satan's judgment. And it was ensuring the freedom of man through Christ. So Paul writes to the Romans and he's declaring that he's been separated or he's been set apart by God from the rest to bring that exact same good news of salvation to the people that goes all the way back to the beginning. So Paul says that he's the bondservant of Jesus. He's called to be an apostle. And he's separated to preach the gospel. In verse 5, we're given a little bit more information as to where this power and this authority that Paul speaks with, where it comes from. He makes a, big claim, he makes a lot of big claims in the book of Romans. And he dives into a lot of deep doctrine about salvation, on, on faith alone, uh, through grace alone, and Christ alone. And he, he gives a lot of doctrine and a lot of theology in the book of Romans. And that's one reason I really love the book of Romans. It's, it's said to be the constitution of the Christian. The Magna Carta for the Christian. That the, the Christian can go to the book of Romans and they can see what life as a Christian is supposed to be like. And so Paul says here that he, has, he was given power to write these words, but it doesn't come from himself. No, it, he, Paul says it was through Christ that they had received grace and apostleship. The only reason the same man who had made it his life's ambition to hunt down and to kill Christians was now preaching the gospel of the same Jesus is because of the power that he received through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Prior to that Damascus Road conversion that we read about, the only power that Paul possessed was the power of hate and the determination to wipe out this new cult called Christianity. The only thing he wanted to do was to stop the, this threat of, of the loss of power that he and the rest of uh, uh, of the, the Sanhedrin and the rest of the Jewish leaders were going to lose if Jesus was right. 
Paul's determination was to exterminate all Christians. Paul's determination was to arrest them and to have them put to death. His sin and his hate was so strong that he wrote in the book of, uh, in a separate letter to Timothy and he called himself the chief of all sinners. But now that God, the, the, the Spirit, has come to dwell within Paul, he says it was through the Holy Spirit or through God that they received grace and apostleship. He took a complete 180, not because of anything that he did, not because of the power that Paul had, not because of the ability to preach that Paul possessed. He says, God gave me that power. God gave me that apostleship. God gave me that grace. And because he gave me that, I'm able to do the work that he's called me to do. It was through Jesus Christ that he had received grace and mercy. My, I like the way my systematic theology professor says this. He says, grace is receiving from God that blessing which we do not deserve. And mercy is not receiving from God that punishment and judgment which we do rightly deserve. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Grace is receiving forgiveness that you don't deserve forgiveness. Grace is receiving that power from God to preach the gospel when you haven't done anything to deserve that power. Grace is receiving from God forgiveness and, 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 and that power. Mercy is not receiving judgment. Mercy is not receiving that damnation that God's righteousness demands that we have. Mercy is not being uh, condemned to hell because God has come to live within us. Mercy is God dying on the cross as a punishment, uh, taking on the punishment of our sin, even though that should have been us on the cross. And so Paul receives his grace because he trusted in the saving power of Jesus Christ. Paul received the call and the blessing on his life because he allowed the blood of Christ to wash him clean. Paul received the righteousness of God because he allowed Jesus to be the Lord of his life. Paul uh, received the power to cast out demons and to act as an apostle because he allowed the power of Christ to work through him. Paul's work, Paul's writings, Paul's ministry were all made possible because he had said that through Jesus they received grace and apostleship. Everything that he did, when we look at all of the work that Paul did, Paul says the only reason I could do that was because God gave me grace and apostleship. And then in verse 6 is where Paul kind of drops a bomb on the readers. He tells the believers in Rome, and then God is telling you and I as well, that you also are called of Jesus Christ. Paul's not alone in his description of, 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 to begin this letter. Paul's not alone in his description of who he is. The titles that he, use, that he uses to describe himself are not exclusive to him. Paul is telling the most unlikely of people, the Romans, that they too have been called out to do the exact same work that Paul is doing. Paul is telling these people who live in Rome to do the work. And they're telling them to be proud bondservants of Christ. Telling them to go out and to preach the gospel to the lost and dying world. This would not have been a popular uh, message for the Romans to go out and to, to preach and to, to do what Paul was instructing them to do. They, they very well may have already lost loved ones. They very well may have already lost friends. And they are very well are kind of in somewhat of hiding because they've chosen to be a Christian. It, to, to be a Christian in Rome was not a safe thing. Paul says that just to place your faith in Jesus Christ was not enough. Just to place your faith in Jesus Christ can no longer um, uh, just be where you stop at. You can no longer continue to hide in the corners of your home and hope that no one finds out. It's time to, to pull up your bootstraps and get to work. It's time to step out on your faith where the Lord is leading you. It's time for you to look fear and anger and hatred in the face and allow the power that comes through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit to change who you are. Because in Rome, it's a, it was a dangerous place to be a Christian. And Paul says, 
I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ and you too are now called to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. You're now called to put aside your sovereignty. You're now called to put aside your will and and submit to the supreme will of Christ. You're now called to seek the desires and the will uh, of the Lord uh, uh, in every aspect of your life. We must be in prayer every day, humbling ourselves before our God and seeking His way. What is His desire in your relationships? What is His desire in your job? What is His desire in your home? What is His desire in your marriage? What is His desire for your kids or for your kids' future spouses? What is His desire in everything that you do? Every step that you take? Every morning that you wake up? What is God's desire in your life? And if we're acting outside of that will of God, if we're acting outside of that, then we're placing ourselves in a very dangerous position. We are placing ourselves in a position that we may not want to be in. A bond servant, uh, a be a bond servant and submit to his authority. Second, not only is Paul called out to do the work of an apostle, so are you. God saved you so that you could work toward the salvation of others. God rescued you from sin so that you could reach out and help in the rescuing of others as well. God may not have called you to be a preacher. God may not have called you to be a pastor or an evangelist or a minister. God may not have called you to have some official role within a church. But God did call you to do His work and to to do it under His authority. And if you don't feel the call of the Lord on your life to do something, if you don't feel the call of the Lord on your life to serve Him in some capacity, then something ain't right. Something is not clicking just the way that it's supposed to. If you don't feel His tugging or His, his pulling at your, at your ear, wanting you to listen to Him, then something's not right. Because God, if you have His Holy Spirit living within you, He's always going to be speaking to you. He's always going to be trying to guide you and direct you and point you in the direction that He wants you to go. And when you don't hear that, and you don't feel that, either one, you are not saved and you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you, or you're being stubborn and hard-headed and won't listen. Either way, something's not right, and you need to get your life back where it needs to be. You too have been called of the Lord to serve Him. When you begin to question um, uh, how you're supposed to do this, when you begin to question what am I supposed to do in my life, when you get, begin to question <coughs> Excuse me. Where is the Lord directing me? How am I supposed to serve? How am I supposed to act? How am I supposed to, to be in this ministry? What is it that God wants me to do? I don't have the power to do that. I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm not this great, you know, massive uh, uh, soul winner. I can't go out and be an evangelist. I can't do these things. I'm scared to death to speak in public. When you begin to ask yourself, How am I supposed to do that? You have to remember what it was that empowered Paul. It was the Lord that filled and empowered the apostles. It was the Lord that gave them the authority. It was the Lord that gave them the strength that they needed. It was the power of the Lord and the strength of the Lord that uh, that they were able to heal the sick. That's the only reason they were able to do it. It was through the power of the Lord that they were able to make the lame walk again. It was through the power of the Lord that they were able to cast out demons. It wasn't because they were special in any way. It wasn't because they had some uh, a different calling on their life. They simply bowed to the rule of the Lord. They simply said, okay God, what is it that you want us to do And then they gave up their sovereignty. They gave up their will. They gave up their abilities and strength and said, okay, God, now you do the work. The bottom line is this. You've been called to be a bondservant. You've been called to be a slave, no matter if you like that title or not. God has called you to be a bondservant. He's called you to serve the Lord. And He's called you to be separated and to be set apart from everybody else.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for uh, Your rule in our life. Lord, thank You that You have called us to do Your work. Lord, that You've asked us, uh, or You've told us, Lord, that we are supposed to be serving You. Lord, that we are supposed to be acting on Your behalf. You've called us to do Your work. And I pray that each and every one of us would see that and would jump on that opportunity to do whatever it is that You've called us to do. Lord, may we see where the power comes from. Lord, may we see where the ability comes from. And may we grab a hold of that, Lord, and just run with it. May we be a church who understands that it's not based on the ability of people of Liberty Baptist Church, but it's based on the, the power and the abilities of the God that fills Liberty Baptist Church. And so, Lord, today we ask that You would change us. Lord, we ask today, as Paul is writing to the Romans, Lord, that we would be bondservants, that we would be separated, that we would do Your work. And we just pray right now that You would speak to each and every one of us, Lord, in whatever way that You need us to respond today. Uh, if it's to a calling, Lord, if it's to salvation, I pray that You would speak to us today. And we, we, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.